Boom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 11th of the first month on our creator's calendar as we reckon it. Also known as the Zadok calendar, the Hanok or Enoch calendar, the 364 day calendar that doesn't change that was with all throughout the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, and we it happens to line up with the 23rd of March today. Uh, with the 2024 for the Gregorian calendar there. Last week, we covered what was in the Apostolic Constitutions about how we are supposed to keep the festival of uh, Pesach, right? And it covers all the festivals. It covers a lot of information. Really amazing. Highly recommend you go over it. But one of the problems with the text that was right at the header of it as a preface to what we were reading was that the, the dates were changed in the Apostolic Constitutions. Any copy you can find online or purchase yourself, you're going to find the dates that it mentions that he was he died, he was buried, and he resurrected to coincide with the beliefs of Catholicism today, where he died on Prep Day, or what they call Good Friday, and he was dead on the weekly Sabbath, and then he rose again on the Sunday, the first day of the week for them. <clears throat> and this isn't hidden. It's a known uh, doctrine of theirs. So I don't really want to get into that. But the point I want to show is that they're Nicolaitans, right? And the Nicolaitans is what Serenthus was. And the book of Yahukanon was directly written to refute their teachings, so that's the purpose I want to try to cover, that what we have in the good news, when properly looked at according to how they tell us to, not just doing what we want, we can get the, the basora, the, the factual accounts that line up exactly with the calendar that we find in Qumran. And the key is in Yahukanon, as we're going to show you here. But this is a writing called Against Heresies. That's the title of it today. That's not what Irenaeus called it himself. He called it the refutation. Um, it was in the argument of the refutation against heresies. Actually, I I'm mess messing that up, sorry. His taught one, Hippolytus, wrote a book or books titled The Refutation of All Heresies, kind of like a 2.0 of his five books writings right here, where he was going into even more detail about the Gnosticism, the corruption and the perversions that were being done, even into his times. And he lived well into the third century AD, the 200s AD, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. But this book was written about 180, they say, AD, and this picture is with the Nicolaitan takeover. They have the signs of Tammuz. They got their symbology and all that garbage, their halo. None of that was by Irenaeus, okay? But they held all these writings, and they put a veneer <clears throat> of paganism on it, just like it mentions in the book of the Maccabees, where they took the books of the laws and they put their image on it, right? Same thing they did with the writings of the emissaries, their taught ones, and the words of our Mashiach themselves, where they literally took the truth, laid him, and made him unrecognizable. Right? This was foretold for our, for our benefit. He is the word made flesh. But back on point. Serenthus, this is the one that we want to cover real quick. I want to show you something. Doctrines of Serenthus is also tied with the Ebionites and Nicolaitans here. This is just from chapter 26. He really goes into a whole bunch of all of the Gnosticism that was around. Eventually, this coalesced into the absurdities that people would believe into one religion that we call Catholicism. Okay? And it continued to amalgamate the mystery religion, the philosophy of the Greeks, and, and the, the paganism from Babylon into itself even to this day that's why it can identify with all these pagan religions of all the 
third world countries, if you want to call them that, or all these other nations when they first came to them, how they still held to the mystery religions. And it was identical in different ways to the Mary worship and the things of Catholicism. But um, that's for a different time. So right here, it says, Sorinthus again, a man who was educated in the wisdom of the Egyptians. That wisdom of the Egyptians is also what they call the desert fathers of the early Christians who came from Alexandria, Egypt and the deserts of, of Mitzrayim there where they where they would go to become endowed with wisdom and then come out from that area to propagate their doctrines, okay? In Scripture, Mashiach explains what happens when you cast out demons, where they go off into the lonely waste places, and there they, they find it no man to dwell, and they come back to re-inhabit men. So these, these people, twisted as they were, they go out into the lonely waste places to find those demons that were cast out. And then they associate with them. They get their marching orders, talking to demons. The same thing you can read about that happened to um, Muhammad, getting visions from demons in a cave. Um, same thing that happened with Ignatius de Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, afflicting himself, causing trauma, causing visions, and getting marching orders from demons. Okay? That's how Rome has worked with its divination, with ancestor worship and getting marching orders from demons. That, that's how the music industry works today and movies and other things. I don't really want to get into all that, but I'm saying that same pattern of taking marching orders from entities outside of yourself is what they've been doing for a very long time. <clears throat> and he's no different. But their wisdom of the Egyptians is what what is known as the Nag Hammadi Library. It's known today. You can look at it. I don't, I don't really in, encourage that. But if you study or you have been studying the, anti the Antichrist for Dummies video series on YouTube from christmasisalie.com YouTube channel, um, they go into detail about the Nag Hammadi Library the wisdom of the Egyptians that was learned by these people and what it is they're promulgating. So Serenthus uh, being the instigator of the Trinity of Ogdoads of the, the December 25th is all literally known, written and recorded, but it's hidden from us today. <clears throat> so anyways, and it says, it taught that the world was not made by the primary mighty Elohim, by a certain power far separated from him. The same thing that Simon the Magician was trying to promote or promulgate in his uh, discourses with Kepha in Caesarea that you can see in the recognitions of Clement. So you see different men at different times promoting the same error because they have the same spirit behind them. Okay. And it says, and distant from that principality who is supreme over the creation and ignorant of him who is above all. He represents Yahushua as having not been born of a virgin. Okay. These are beliefs that some people hold to today as well. But as being the son of Yahusuf and Miriam, according to the ordinary course of man's generation. While he nevertheless was more righteous, prudent, and wise than other men. That's the same thing they say Ebionites hold to, right? It says, moreover, after his immersion, Mashiach descended upon him from the form or in the form of a dove from the supreme ruler. These are the errors that he was promulgating at the time. Okay. The point I wanted to show is this is Serinthus. It mentions the Ebionites who hold that kind of same doctrine. And they practice cir circumcision. They repudiate Shaul, right? They only hold to certain accounts of the good news and they reject others. And they call themselves pious, right? These are, these are literally things people are doing today. That's why I'm, I'm pointing that out. But I don't want to, I don't want to blast anybody. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to talk down to anyone. I found these things and I was shocked that Thousands of years ago, 
they could foretell things that were happening. I mean, it was about 10 years old and going on now, but right before my very eyes, and it blew me away. So right here, the Nicolaitans of whom Catholicism is the what came of that, right? That's what is found throughout the Antichrist for Dummies. The revelation that was given in the book of Revelation is all about this, okay? This is the Nicolaitans, of whom Serenthus was a member, right? Are the followers of Nicholas, who was one of the seven first ordained to the, be a deacon or minister by the emissaries. And you remember I I'd mentioned our Mashiach is like the sun. He's the bridegroom. And he's like the greater light or the light of the world. Psalm 19 mentions the sun is like the bridegroom. Okay. The Malkuth Shamayim, the kingdom of the heavens, is like the moon. It's what he came preaching. Right. And it is also tied to the earthly kingdom of which Dawid was key. It was key to him. And you have the, you have the genealogy of our Mashiach proving that out as well. We covered that in Gad the Seer, and we've mentioned it a few times, but there's 14 generations from Abraham to Dawid, like the crescent to the full moon, and 14 generations from Dawid to the captivity or to Tetafi going off to Ireland, so like the full moon back to the, the waning crescent, and then 14 generations from after the captivity to the coming of our Mashiach from the crescent to the full moon again. And that is the kingdom that he was coming and, and making known. And then the emissaries, the 12, are like the 12 constellations of which they each went out to build assemblies, which were like the deacons and ministers. So you had the 12 and then the 72, which also is like the nations. But it was, um, it's like what you see in the sky, the sun, moon, and then the constellations and the stars, which are the deacons for those star, those constellations, right? Aside from those, you have the seven planets, as they're called. And planets in the Greek means wanderer or the wandering stars because they do not have a fixed orbit like the rest of them. They, they are individually unique in their circuits or over the earth there. And that was reminiscent of Again, our Mashiach, the sun, the Malkuth is the moon, the 12 are like the stars, and the taught ones that went out with them are like the deacons and ministers, and then or the, the teachers and evangelists, if you will, right? The other taught ones that he had sent out after the 12. And then the seven would have been like the planets, but there's only five that are visible to the naked eye. And then you have Stephan, who was a martyr, and Nicholas, who was an apostate. And those would correspond with the two that are not visible to the naked eye. And the one that represents Nicholas there happens to be popping up different places throughout Revelation too, is that messenger when there's bad stuff going on. If, if you're paying attention, I think that one, I, I can't remember which one it is exactly, but we'll have to double check. I think there's Uranus and there's another one that you can't see. But back on point, it says the Nicolaitans are the followers of that Nicholas, who is one of the seven first ordained to minister by the emissaries. They lead lives of unrestrained indulgence. Whatever they please, right? Including violating little boys and other things that are everything contrary to the truth, to his word, what is loving and right. These are eventually what uh, everyone that's serving the adversary will cling to. And that's been universally true from the first magician to the Canaanites and all the way to today. If you really want to get a comparison, I, you don't have to look very far if you look into MK Ultra and then just read the wisdom of Solomon, Chokma Shalomo, right? But in there, starting from chapter 12, I believe there's a few chapters, it covers the things that the Canaanites were doing and why. And it's the very same things, because if you take whatever Yahuwah enjoins by his word for a man to do, and you just invert it, that's what you get, okay? 
says the character of these men is very plainly pointed out in the apocalypse of Yahoo Kanan when they are represented as teaching that it is a matter of indifference to practice adultery or fornication, right? And to eat things offered to idols, okay? Wherefore the word has also spoken of them thus, by this you have, or but this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate, okay? Now, the the next mention of Sorinthus is right here, but this does not have the part that we're wanting. I'm just trying to show you there are other mentions. I'm not trying to be hidden, but for our purposes, he's going over all the different heretical doctrines and beliefs, and he covers about four or three and a half books doing that. And then he uses the last the last part of this five book series to show the the correct doctrines with scripture predominantly. So you have to bear with that. And the purpose of his going through this was not for everyone to get into. It wasn't for the layman to concern himself with so much as it was for the, the minister to be aware of these things, to prevent against it, and to, to speak of it when it came up. Although anyone can read them now. The point I want to make, though, is if you, if you look at this stuff, if you study these truths, you are accountable for the truth that has been delivered to you, and how you respond to him will be requited accordingly, right? This is an interesting, uh, for people who keep Christmas or keep Sunday, and, 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 and or in, intentionally when they should know better call on the wrong names, I'm not saying people who do things in ignorance, but when you're doing a thing that is what anything that he calls a Gnostic practice, and you are intentional in it. This is what Yahukanon did when he was here. Okay. It says, but Polycarp also was not only instructed by the emissaries, but conversed with many who had seen Mashiach, but was also by emissaries in Asia or what we call Turkey, appointed overseer of the assembly in Smyrna, which you can read about, as well as the others that were anointed as overseers in the apostolic constitutions. And Polycarp anointed Irenaeus, and Irenaeus anointed Hippolytus, and these are literally a succession of emissaries or overseers that we are commanded to take heed to, just as we are to hear our Mashiach, and he gave it to his emissaries, his emissaries gave it to the overseers. So just for context there. Um, and that's part of that chain of command from Moshe. He says, one's coming like me whom you should listen to. And then our Mashiach ordained the 12 and then the multitude, right? And then the 12 ordained the overseers they established. <clears throat> but it says, whom I also saw in my early youth, for he tarried a very long time, Polycarp. And when a very old man, splendorously and most nobly suffering martyrdom, or suffering being a witness, right? Departed this life, having always taught the things which he had learned from the emissaries and which the assembly has handed down and which alone are true. To these things, all the Asiatic assemblies testify. So all the assemblies of Turkey, the ones that were written to in Revelation, okay? as do also those men who have succeeded Polycarp down to the present time, a man who was of much greater height, or sorry, weight, and a more steadfast witness of truth than Valentinius and Marcion and the rest of the heretics. He it is who, Polycarp, okay, who it is coming to Rome in the time of Anicetus, caused many to turn away from the aforesaid heretics to the assembly of Elohim, proclaiming that he had received this one and sole truth from the emissaries, that namely which is handed down by the assembly. There are also those who heard from him that Yahukanon, the taught one of Yahuwah, going to bathe at Ephesus, and perceiving Serenthus within, rushed out, 
of the bathhouse without bathing. As soon as he realized that man was in there, he, he left, rushed out, exclaiming, let us fly, lest even the bathhouse fall down, because Serenthus, the enemy of the truth, is within. It mentions in the scriptures that he who goes with the wise shall be wise, and he who goes with the fool shall be known, right? It mentions that wickedness rises up on every side when worthlessness is exalted among the sons of men, which is why you got the circus and games and entertainment to distract people, okay? There's a whole different thing behind that. But the idea of having bad things happen because of your association, the, the, the gateway of allowing that is just by being in that same area, right? That he was not willing to risk it. And I think that's an example we ought to follow. But right here, it says, And Polycarp himself replied to Marcion, who met him on one occasion, and said, Do you know me? I do hold, or I do know you, the firstborn of Satan. That's what Polycarp said to Marcion. Such was the horror which the emissaries and their taw ones had, hold, had against holding even verbal communication with any corruptors of the truth. Those are the pestilent ones that intentionally not only just live in the air that they hold to, but like disease-ridden men infect others, okay? <clears throat> As Shaul also says, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he or knowing that he that is such is subverted and sins, being condemned of himself. Titus three ten. There is also a very powerful epistle of Polycarp written to the Philippians, from which those who choose to do so, and are anxious about their deliverance can learn the character of his belief and the preaching of the truth. And I've read that one. It is part of what they call the anti-Nicene writings. Um, there's a 10-volume series, nine volumes, and then one's an index or a, a, a codex of it, if you will, <clears throat> of the writings, generally of the writings of the patriarchs for the first 300 years. And while... You can find treasures in them like the recognitions of Clement, the apostolic constitutions, the longer, the full versions of the epistles of Ignatius and Polycarp, uh, the shepherd of Hermas. I mean, really amazing stuff in there. You also have some Gnostic garbage that's been just piled on to really turn you away from it. So there, there's a big, there's a big filtering you have to do when you look at it, but it is an it's an exact representation of what Rome did to the truth. And um, it's evident for anyone that wants to pay attention. One of the things you can find that's very interesting in that, that is mentioned also in the Apostolic, or um, in the Antichrist for Dummies series, is that uh, the teacher of Constantine, I believe, Lactanus, or maybe it was his son, he teaches about the epsilon and the, the proverb with regarding that letter and the broad way and the narrow way, but he teaches it in relation to the sun, where our, our Mashiach teaches it in relation to the narrow way is the truth, and the broad way leads to that destruction that the sun worshipers are all heading towards. All right, the part that we want to get to again Right. This is founded by, again, the Assembly of Ephesus, founded by Shaul, and having Yahukanon remaining among them permanently until the times of Trangin is a true witness of the tradition of the emissaries. After Yahukanon right, was released from Patmos, after he wrote the book of Revelation, he helped with the assemblies for a while there until the time of Trangin, the, the uh, emperor there, or the Caesar, if you will. But the last one I want to mention here is the uh, mention of Serenthus, Book 3, Chapter 11. We've read this before, The why the Basora, or the good news, accounts are four in number and the reason for it. I don't want to read the whole thing now again, but just to recap, the order of them is Yahukanon, or John, Luke, 
Matith Yahoo and Mark going to corresponding with the lion, the bull, the man, and the eagle with the four cardinal constellations there and the four winds and the different and the four Basora accounts. Keeping in mind, Yahukanon is first. So the last one written, but first in order here. And as you recall, mentioned here, <coughs> um, sorry, it's mentioned right here. It says, Yahukanon, the taught one of Yahua, preaches this belief and seeks by proclamation of the Basora to remove that error which by Serinthus had been disseminated among men and a long time previously by those termed Nicolaitans, okay, who are an offset of that Gnosticism, right, that knowledge falsely so called, that he might confound them and persuade them that there is but one Elohim, not three in one, not three co-equal, co-eternal in one, just one only, who created one begotten, who had one Ruach that does the will that he speaks, right? As he speaks, because is the word that he speaks is Ruach in life, right? <clears throat> but anyways, back to the point. Yahukanon wrote this to refute the error of Serenthus and the Nicolaitans. This is the point that I want to uh, point out. So when we know that Serenthus and the Nicolaitans promulgated that error that is today known as Catholic Christianity. We don't have to guess at what that error would be in regard to the calendar. We we already covered that. They they plainly talk about what they believe that is directly contrary to the plain text. Anyone can still read in any scriptures, any Bible you want to pick up, even the NIV, their map doesn't work. But they hold to that because they hold to the father of lies. It is just the way things are. And it's easy to see these things are error because the truth is simple. But men will get you to believe things that aren't true, contrary to the plain text that is there, right? So now with this being shown, that the, the Basora from Yahukanon was the, the whole purpose was to refute the, the Nicolaitans and Serenthus, that's the account we should go to to look at things first, which is what I would recommend. But you can really do that from any of them, okay? So with that being said, please give me just one moment. Okay, so real quick, and this is just, we're, we're not going to be able to cover every part of these accounts. So I want to direct you and anyone that wants to study this out to where you can look at these and then line them up. But the whole purpose here is to show that we can use the book of Yahukanon as the primary source of what was meant to refute the promulgated error from the Nicolaitans, excuse me, from Serenthus and the Nicolaitans, which is Catholicism. Okay. And this calendar happens to coincide exactly without any deviation or difference with the exact calendar that was found at amongst Qumran or the uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls found at Qumran. This calendar right here. Okay. So in particular, we're going to keep in mind this first month. And if you remember, we've already gone over how you can determine a year. And how you can see that even in what we call the Bible or the common, the scriptures common to us all, you can see how this calendar is legitimate in Exodus 16, where it goes over the account of the manna for the week. It's right here. And you can backtrack and find out that this would be the first day of the year, right? There's other things that point that out. But really, when you look at the scrolls within the Dead Sea Scrolls at Qumran, the Geniza text that was found in Egypt, and the other things that are all part of the what they call the Zadok Library, if you will, it makes it unequivocal 
the very dates are explicitly pointed out for every single feast. I mean, explicit dates for when the flood happened in different accounts to where there's nothing that is necessarily hidden. If anything could be called ambiguous in any part of that, it would be how oil and wood work together. Because in the text in the temple scroll, which is the only reference you have for how to keep wine, oil, and wood, the text on when to start oil is fragmented. The wood reference is not, or um, the oil, sorry, maybe it's the wood reference is fragmented or the oil is not, but one of the two. And it's kind of ambiguous when, if one should start on the same day or the day after. However, when you look at the account of the Psalms of Dawid, and it gives a list of all the Psalms and songs that he spoke through foretelling, it literally tells you he made one for every day of the year, 364, one for every festival day, Chodesh, and Sabbath. Uh, so you had 52 for every Sabbath, and those are called the songs of the Sabbath sacrifices, right? There's 13 in each season, and we only have the first 13, more or less, not all of them intact in the best condition. But then um, you have every festival day, and it counts 30 of them to include four Chodesh, or four new months. And if you count those out, the oil and the wood have to be on the same day. So that's how that determination was made. Otherwise, there is no way to know from the text itself. And I'm only telling you guys that because I don't like to be, I don't like to be dishonest with anything. Okay. So anyways, the point we want to keep in mind and the focus we, we have for today is going to be the account that we read. You're going to see right here that Yahukanon pretty much starts right here on the 9th, and he gives you a day by day of everything that goes on until right here in the evening of the Sabbath. And then he says, accordingly, eight days later, they have another meal, and that's where Thomas is. And it follows this calendar exactly with no deviation, no break, no, no uh, ambiguity. So when it says before the Pesach, they kept a meal, it's very clear it's talking about here. And then when you line up the other accounts with this one, you're going to find that they talk about on the first of the unleavened bread, they keep a Pesach. And it seems like they're talking about, oh, well, he kept the meal and then they had his, he, he, he must have been keeping two festivals. And that's where the confusion is coming. But when you when you look at the text, the original Greek there, and you look at what that word is that's translated that way, look at how many times it's translated that way and where it is translated that way, and then how many times it's translated other ways. You'll find that those every one of those first is a before also. And that's something I had mentioned, I think we were talking about it before we were recording. But there's a phenomenon, I believe it's in the Greek as well, although I'm not familiar with the language as I am with the Hebrew. But the word in the Greek can mean first, but also can mean before. And the word in Hebrew like that is kadem, kof, dalet, maim, qdm, if you will, which again, it means east to bore through before and first. It can mean all of those depending on context. So with that being said, I just want to show you here and we'll, we'll get on with it. This account, Yahukanon, you, you start with in chapter 12, and it says when Yahushua, or then Yahushua, six days before the Passover came, all right, right, before the Passover, he came to Beth Annie, where Eleazar was, which was dead, all right, and then he had the supper, and Martha served, and Miriam poured the ointment on his feet, and Yahuda Ishkiriot grumbled about that. Okay, so if you look right here, here's the Pesach. This is one, 
because remember the Pesach is in the evenings, between the evenings. So this is one day, two, three, four, five, and six. Six days before the Pesach, exactly on the calendar. This is the day that he would be having that supper. All right. <clears throat> and then he each carry out new then he tried to he tried to work with the kohenim there on turning him in right it mentions on the next day the people heard that he was coming to Yerushalayim they found the donkey with the young donkey they brought it in singing hushana or hosanna right save us now right and Baruch is he who's coming in the name of Yahuwah. That happened the next day, which as you see, would be the 10th. That very day is the same day that the lamb is to be brought in. And then for four days, one, two, three, four, they are inspect, or sorry, they're brought in on the 10th. And then for the 11th, 12th, 13th, and 14th day, they are inspected and then killed in the evening. So that's what happened. He came in on the 10th, spent the four, and he was offered. Okay. Um, and you can find that, I believe it's uh, the 10th. Yeah, so Shemot or Exodus 12, verse 3, it says, Speak to all the congregation of Yisrael, saying, On the tenth yom of this new month, each one of them is to take a lamb for himself, according to the number of his household, etc., etc. And you also have the instructions um, later on, which mentioned to bring it into the house as well. But it is on that day, the same one, foretelling his very coming, that was the point of it. And I'd like to point out, on the very day they do that is the very day he did that. Not, not a different day. There wasn't conflicting ones. And you, you see no conflict or no admission of a different calendar by him, which surely would have happened. He grumbled about the length of their zitzit. If they were keeping a wrong day on a festival, that's, that's more important. Okay. But um, you gotta, you can read through all the accounts, and I, I, I encourage you to do that. But be mindful just to track and go through and follow the days, right? And then it says right here, now before the Feast of the Pesach, all right? That same word is what I want you to check with the other accounts, okay? Because they'll say first in some of them, but it should say before. Okay, and then that would have been right here on the 13th, which is before the day of the Pesach, right? Before the feast of the Pesach, right? And then he kept that meal with them. He would have been out in Geth Shemini or the oil press, right? The, the press of oils is Geth Shemini, they call it, or Geth Shemini, right? but he was in the oil press where the being afflicted, right? And that was where he was praying. He told his taught ones to stay with him. Yahudi Ish Kiryot brought the uh, multitude and they took him in the night, brought him first to Caiaphas and then mistreated him there, took him to Hanan, his father-in-law, who was distinguished as the uh, man who's of the sons of Aharon, the most prevalent amongst those who were gifted with the high kahuna, because after the time of Herod, it had been just handed off here and there willy-nilly instead of given as it was supposed to be. And while it was still amongst the sons of Aharon, it, it was not according to what was right, and it was causing problems. But Hanan, he had been chosen... The most and of his family 
more of them than any others had been in that position. So they had been the ones that were most inclined to be favorable to Herod, aside from uh, the Maccabean line, who had been in the position at the time and was removed by him. Um, sorry about that. So he, he goes over, he has the beforehand, they go through the evening, right? And then he's taken. I don't want to get into that. We don't have a whole lot of time. But so he he's taken and then brought before Pontius Pilatus. He's convicted at the third hour. He was impaled at the sixth hour. He gave, a, and there was darkness over the land from the third to the sixth hour. And then as it was foretold, there is a day where it's not day or night, but in the evening there shall be light. And at the ninth hour, after he gave up his Ruach, there was light again. Then Yahusuf of Arimathea requested and got his body. And he was buried before sunset, right? And that tome in, Geth, uh, in, the, in the tomb that is actually over there, uh, Ron Wyatt has found these things. He found the locations of them. They have them in the documentaries and videos. I highly recommend you watch this stuff. It, a lot of the things he was able to show the proof of, like Noah's Ark, the, the Red Sea crossing, he could demonstrably show the evidence of the things that he was finding. The one thing he was not able to show the evidence of, at least not a lot, was the Ark of the Covenant. But if you've been following, we just went over parts of the book of Tay Taffy a few weeks ago. And in there, she talks about the hit, the cave in which the Ark was hidden that she went to secretly that was uh, corroborating exactly what Ron Wyatt had said. So an amazing confirmation there. <clears throat> but buried and then three days, one, two, three in the grave, three days and three nights. And then it was in the night of the 17th before the dawn, while it was still dark, that the women came to the tomb to, to anoint him because they, they wanted to clean him up before the Sabbath and they wanted someone to roll away the stone. Remember, they were guards for three days. They couldn't anoint him. They didn't know that it was already done and they wanted to make sure they got to him before he smelled. And when they got there, it was empty. They thought robbers had taken it. This is what you can see as you go through all the accounts. And remember, the accounts were given for different purposes. Yahoo Canaan's account was to refute Serinthus and the Nicolaitans. It is with authority, and it is literally just a, a bold narrative of the things that happened right through it. The account from Luke is of the sacrificial system, the how he was literally the fulfillment of the kahuna exchange and the offerings that were enjoined. Okay, Matith Yahu was his coming as a man and his relation to men as a man. And then Mark is with the flowings of the Ruach, which is what he poured out after he came, which has been leading us ever since unto these times, even today. So <clears throat> if you take the, the Basora in those order and you read through these accounts and you compare it, they all line up and they can't be contrary to one another, okay? They come to the tomb and it's empty. They think that he's been stolen. They go or Miriam goes and she tells the, the uh, 11, the taught ones. Kepha and Yahu Kanan rush to the tomb, see it's empty and they believe that he's been kidnapped or stolen, not kidnapped, right? Then Miriam, they leave. Miriam's still there weeping and the messenger appears to her and then Yahushua and he says do not touch me for I have not yet ascended to my father right that evening because she went and talked to the the others and they didn't believe her that evening after the sun is set he appears to the 11 he doesn't say he, they touch him although you get different Again, in Yahu Kanan, I believe it mentions that they they touch his feet and they do something. You have to keep in mind 
some accounts are meant to be literal it's it's going along with chronology right in line and some of them have a different point to the things they mention it's not supposed to be a direct narrative play by play it's just giving you a sum of the things that happened okay but they cannot be contradictory to one another so if one account is just reciting the things that happened or giving you a, a bullet point of the list of things that went on and quite often you'll see the order is different in the book of mark because it's not trying to give you the accurate chronology it's giving you events and things that transpire according to the purposes of the ruach that was the key but um in the evening of the 18th he appears to them and toma is not with them then it says accordingly eight days later this was already evening so you got to count days it would be from the 19th 20th 21st 22nd 23rd 24th 25th and the 26th that is the eighth day in the evening he appeared to all 12 and it was after first fruits after he had appeared to the father he allowed toma to touch him and it was from this point on that you have the 40 days until the fifth day of the week that he ascended which happens to be the fifth of the third month 10 days before shavuot which is the first of the week so it exactly lines up with this calendar that that was the whole point of uh, what we went over before there's some people today that are believing for whatever reason stuff that just is not written and they the biggest hiccup is they'll take one word that says and on the first of unleavened bread but that word should really say and before unleavened bread just like you see right here where it says before oh let me oh i'm sorry it's actually skipping all the way through there um yahoo can on chapter 12 we'll go back there real quick right at the beginning of that one it says before okay now the other accounts that you want to compare the next one is in luke and you want to start with luke i believe it is chapter 19. this is where and you'll notice that the passing into Yericho is not mentioned it's just a, a blip on the radar for y'all who can on there it might have been beforehand i don't i don't recall but this happens as he's going through and then it skips the encounter and the dinner with Elazar. doesn't quite mention that but it does mention him going in to the city and then the the laying down of the garments and the palm branches and the riding on the donkey so you, you get the timeline for where that's at but not the same events are always being mentioned that's a thing to keep in mind Yahoo Kanan's account was the one that was meant to refute what the Nicolaitans are sharing, which is those wrong dates. These are all corroborating witnesses to the fact. And if you take it in the order that it was told to, that's easier to see. Although you can read them all and compare it, and you should be able to determine and come to the, the, the exact same conclusion. So Yahoo Kanan, starting on chapter... 12 the book of luke here starting in chapter 4 or not 14 um starting in chapter 19 here this is right here where he enters into jericho okay or what they call jericho and then after that he goes to bethany and then he gets to the mount of olives and he tells them to to go in on the colt and donkey okay so after you get through the account from Luke, you would go to Matith Yahoo, and then um, I believe that is uh, chapter 20. Or is it 21? Let me see. Yeah, sorry, it was 21. This is where he's going up to Yarushalayim from Beth Fega. And Beth Fagia and Beth Ani. Um, Beth Fega, I believe, is the house of the fig tree. 
the House of the Figs. I'd have to double check what Beth Bethany, right? They say Bethany. Bet Ani is the house of the poor. But it's also the house of the reply, right? The poor or anything. The, these are the places that were outside of the city where the unclean would go. Lazarus was a leper, if you remember, in his parable. And it's not explicitly stated anywhere in the Basora or Good News accounts. I believe it's somewhere in the anti-Nicene patriarchs writings, so the first 300 years writings. It mentions that Yahukanon here was of the line of the Kohanim, but he couldn't serve. He wasn't ever serving because he was a leper or he had been unclean. And that's why they actually lived here, but why he was known of the Kohanim and able to go in, if you remember during his trial. Now, that's not something that you have to hold to. Doesn't It doesn't have anything to do with your deliverance. It's just for context, okay? But right here in Matthew Theahu, chapter 21, this is where you would start with the account here. And I'll show you. Maybe we can see it here, and you'll find it in the other accounts as well when it gets to the part where it says, uh, it should say before the Pesach, it mentions, and on the first of. And that's where they get the hiccup there. I highly recommend you go through the accounts as they're given because it'll give you, if you if you compare them all and you line them up, you can get a play-by-play -play for what he did on every day. And that's how, that's how I know, for example, Miriam and the other Miriams first went and then they they went and told them and thought that he was kidnapped and then, or thought he was his body was stolen. And then they saw the messengers. You, you got to read all the accounts to get the full sense of it because the, it, it can seem a little discombobulated, if you will, just reading one. Sorry about that. I didn't have all these ready. I really would prefer a different app I, I think i used to use eSword. i don't know if they still have it on here or if they have it for the macbook but i have not found one that i, I really care for the eSword had the isr that you could use all right yeah i passed it up all right so in matith yahoo by the time you get to what is that chapter 25 Yeah, I believe this is chapter 25, and it's on verse 17. And it says, you see, day is in italics there. And it says now, the first of unleavened bread. But you see, the day, and then the feast of. But if it said now, before unleavened bread, the, the taught ones came, that would exactly agree with what's in Yahukanon. And that's that part that word that you guys should look up because i'm telling you just like they do in his resurrection and when it mentions when shaul was congregating and teaching the people there's only nine places where they take a word that says first and they translate it as one and they take the word sabbaton where it's sabbaths and they translate it as day of the week in every one of those places, it's when he rose from the dead and when Shaul was, was preaching or teaching. All of that is to promote Sunday worship, but none of it's true. Okay? <clears throat> These ones hide that he literally rose on one of the Sabbaths, and that doesn't make any sense unless you actually pay attention to his calendar. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is considered a high Shabbat, and then this is one of the Sabbaths right here. The only other terminology they use that for is whenever they're doing their counting. After first fruits, you count seven Sabbaths, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and the next day is Shavuot. 
So the the one of the Sabbaths that's mentioned by Shaul, when Shaul is there, it's in one of the countings. He's there on one of these Sabbaths between here and here, or between first fruits and Shavuot, or between Shavuot and new wine, or between new wine and new oil and wood, because each one of those had their countings of seven Sabbaths that you would repeat like an echo. Um, the last one here before we have to wrap things up, right? Would be in the book of Mark, and that one is on uh, chapter 11 is where you would start. Right here, when you, when they came nigh to Yarushalayim and to Bethphage and Bethany, right? At the Mount of Olives. <clears throat> so, as you can see, they all have different information. If you remember, it says that, and he did more. And he said more than what could be recorded in the whole world could not contain all the books that could be written on the things that he said and did. So the idea that there's information in one account or in two that is not in another does not mean that, oh, well, this one's corrupted. There is a purpose and an intent for why it was mentioned. And if you go back to what his taught ones made evident, like the four Basora and how they're to be regarded, then these things make more sense. At least they do to me. Yahukanon as the lion coming with authority, it's him in his princely aspect. And it is to refute directly, again, the Nicolaitan error. The book of Luke, in the aspect of his, the role of the kahuna, establishing the Levitical kahuna then and exemplifying his fulfillment of the law of all the offerings and his um the transition of the kahuna because not only is yahoo kanon immersing him there but you have i believe that's the only account where you have kayafa tearing his garments and he's the supposed high kohen but when you look in the torah that is permitted it's impermissible for the high kohen to do that or you you're out of office so he literally <laughs> removed himself from any pretentious office at that time, and it was handed to the one in whom it belonged, who was our offering then. So that's all in the book of Luke. You don't see that anywhere else that I'm aware of. Matith Yahu is in the aspect of a man, and that is the only one that you see uh, his trials and labors as a man, came as a brother. That's the whole focus. And again, as we are living through now, where we don't have him intercoursing or appearing to men, it's through the Ruach that he interacts, right? The flowings of the Ruach, the narrative and the way that works is how the book of Mark was written. Not as an exact chronological point in point, this is bullet point, how it happened, nothing deviating. That misses the point, okay? So, um, I'm willing, this is a, a good foot in the door for you. It does nothing if you don't actually go through it. So I would highly recommend you guys, or not just you here, but everyone that listens, go through the video that we listened to last time, read the account there or listen to it from the Apostolic Constitutions, and then compare it with every one of these accounts in the Basora in the order that was established, right? And it should fall in line, as you, as I tried to point out here, Exactly with the calendar that never changes. Because that's the linchpin. His word cannot be broken. And when you can see that Yahukanon is refuting Serinthus. And Yahukanon, without any, without any, you know, crevelling, without any trying to having to fit pieces or, or shovel it in, perfectly lines up with what's right here. Six days before, came in on the 10th with the lambs, right? And then it mentions that before the Pesach, they had their, their supper. The other accounts mention what he did on these days, like what he, what he said and did when he overturned the tables on the Shabbat, when he refuted and talked with them for the first two days right here. It goes over that in the other accounts. But then right before the Pesach, what he does in the evening, the things that he mentions there in Yahukanon, then being taken, it all follows exactly with this calendar. And there is not two of them being kept. 
then that was the entire point of that if if there was such a thing there would be some plain reference to it because he's not an author of confusion so i'm willing that's edifying and we can all grow from that please if you have any comments or questions or if anything comes up that you want to share that seems to be in agreement or disagreeing don't hesitate because we're all still learning i appreciate your time you have a wonderful rest of your shabbat a shavua tov ahead which for us this next week is the pesach week with our our fast involved in everything but we can still do it in him and rejoice in our affliction so thank you for your time you have a wonderful day and uh shavua tov and we'll see you next time